Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern Time and that means it's time to begin another of our Kokoros monthly Weather Talk webinars. In fact, this is our 20th webinar. Hard to believe we've done that many. Uh, we started back in December of 2011. have had a lot of interesting guests and uh, we're really excited about our lineup for the rest of the season here. Well, thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis. Along with me is Kokoros founder and Colorado State climatologist, Nolan Dusk. Behind the scenes today running our program are Zach Schwalbe and Noah Newman. We appreciate them being back there. Uh, we're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here at Colorado State University in partly cloudy uh, Fort Collins, Colorado this morning. For those of you, of you who are unable to join us live for our broad, broadcast today, we'll be recording it for future viewing on our website. And all of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. Well, today we look at a sub, the subject of rainwater harvesting, and most of our audience already measures it. Why not harvest it for use at your homes? Uh, and rainwater harvesting is legal in most states. We'll talk more about that as well. You'll learn much more about this ancient art. I'm sure people have been doing this uh, for a long time now of collecting rainwater. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Well, with us today is Billy Niffin. Billy is a, a water resource associate in the Biological and Ag Agricultural Engineering Department with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. He is the Vice President and Education Trainer for the American Rainwater Catchment Systems Association. I met Billy at, at that uh, annual conference last year in Raleigh, North Carolina, and boy, I tell you, you really learn, we learned a lot about uh, this, this art of catching rainwater. Uh, Billy and his wife live in Menard, Texas, and get this, their home is solely dependent on rainwater, and Billy will tell you a little bit more about that. Welcome, Billy. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, hello, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here, to be able to talk with you. I'm trying to bring up a PowerPoint now, and so that hopefully that you can see that. Uh, is that I'm trying to make sure that it is uh, uh, available? Can you see it? It's on its way. There we go. Okay. Looks great. It looks great. All Thanks, right. Billy. All right. Take it Very away. good. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I thank you for coming on and uh, listening to a little bit of a talk on rainwater harvesting. I live deep in the heart of Texas, right at the western edge of the hill country, a geographic center of Texas, where we have all kinds of things growing. Uh, whether it's going to be a cactus or then we are really home to lots of wildflowers uh, and then a little bit of rain. Uh, I work with the Texas A&M University and I try to then do rainwater education across the state of Texas and try to help move it forward. And so as we get into the topic, I would like to really just uh, help us begin to understand the value of water as we start off. There's so much of the world where water is so precious. People work so much of their time is dealing with bringing water in, water-related diseases, and uh, then within the, the disinfection of water is just not there. Uh, it causes more deaths than anything else of uh, children worldwide. And so in the United States, we take it for granted most often, but as we look down the road, We've got to really take care of this resource. If we want to be a sustainable nation, we want to have this world that is going to continue to then be sustainable. I want this blue planet to always then have plenty of fresh water to drink. When we look at the first world population, as we look at where we are today, we've never been here in this, in this planet. Our population is growing extremely fast. It's growing right now, and the future projections are that we're going to need more water to take care of the needs of, of our people, not only in this nation, but worldwide as our population grows. And as we do that, we see that need for water. There's going to be more and more places where their water needs are not going to make, made, not going to keep up with the demand that we have. We see that happening all across the United States, especially in the southwest part of the United States where our aquifers are just not then able to keep up. Here in Texas, we talk about the number of springs that used to flow. It's estimated there used to be about 10,000 springs that flowed in the state of Texas. Today, only about 60% of those springs are still flowing. 40% of those are dried up, and we look at that region, and 
It has to do with when we're just not getting enough water back into the aquifer, plus we're taking water out faster than we should, which is going to leave many of us in, in water deprivation as the future goes on. As we look today where the drought is, much of the western part of the United States has been in severe drought or then in moderate drought, uh, and that is continuing, and a lot of it's been in long-term drought as we see this. I drove up from central Texas up to Colorado just recently, and it was mostly brown all the way up there. We know of the wildfires that have taken place, especially in Colorado and New Mexico, some of the worst droughts and fires that we've had uh, in recent uh, history, or even in as many of us even know about. And so as we look at our prediction of where water is going to come from or where it is going, we see that that bottom green in part of that graph shows that the amount of irrigation has taken place from 1900 to where we are today. We've got electricity. We've got the ability to drill deep wells, build large systems of irrigations, and so we're pumping more water. That means that we do have a lot more food then available then to us than we did back in 1900, but our demand is higher as well. We see that the municipal water demand is going to increase, industrial is going to increase. Then the other thing there at the top blue line, our reservoirs are going to be losing water. Uh, we're losing it from evaporation. We're filling our, our reservoirs from bottom up with sediment, and we're losing the water that we have available to us then as time goes on. And as we look at our aquifers as well, that top line is going to be our total withdrawal and that's from 1945 to expected to be in 2045, we see that we're going to continue to pull more and more water out of aquifers, and many of those are not going to meet the needs that we have. The second line is going to be our U.S. population that's going to increase, and we're going to have to learn how to utilize less water in the United States as then our population continues to grow. We're going to see that needs down below those in the bottom three lines, or two of them are going to increase, which is going to be demand, but that other demand is that in purple is going to decrease. That means we're going to have less water available to us for irrigation. As cities demand more water, need more water, they're going to be able to purchase it or then be able to take it from other sources there, leaving then agriculture there with less water. And so we're going to have to be more efficient in the water that we have, and then find other sources of food, not only in the United States, but outside of our borders. So these are showing some drops in our aquifer. This is in, in uh, Virginia, where these are continue to drop as our population grows and our demand for water continues to increase. And so we may see that we may know the value of water when that well runs dry. And there are places in the United States where the wells have run dry, which gives us all concern, and we're trying to find out where can I find other sources of water. And that may be then where rainwater is going to be able to play a part in that. But we see the day that we may be fighting over oil, but we're going to be fighting over water as time goes on. And many of our cities are already setting up themselves in position to be able to get water, buy water, pipe water to other locations from other locations to meet their needs as they need it in the major cities in the United States. And so I want us to think, as you, you have rain that falls on your place, understand that every drop of rain is valuable. And when it lands on your house, lands on your property, you decide where it goes. And are you then managing that water so that it is going to either stay on your property or leave very slow, clear, and then add then to that water supply? Or then we're letting it run off then where it then adds more pollution and added more storm water, and then we're not having it then available to us to go into the ground. And so as we look at rainwater, I want us to think that we're either part of the problem are part of the solution. And that's where capturing rainwater is going to help us be part of the solution as we work through. So there's only two ways that we're going to be able to meet the needs for the future. First, we either got to figure out how to build another larger supply. In most cases, that's going to be building more lakes, which then is not happening in the United States. We probably are taking out more lakes than we're adding to that supply right now. And so the other option is either reduce that demand. That increased supply may be water that's in storage tank that we caught rainwater, uh, but that reduced demand has got to be something we do inside of our house as well as outside of our house to meet future needs and so that we can sustain ourselves for future generations. 
And so as we look at rainwater harvesting, there, there's a number of different reasons why we may be wanting to be a part of it. Certainly that increase in demand as we see our population grows and our supply decreases. Looking at the environmental cost, many of our, our pipelines in most of our major cities then are then reaching the end of their life expectancy and we're having to replace much of that infrastructure in many of our cities as well as as we add more to it then it costs money, costs more money today than it did in the past to then put in the pipeline, put in then the the storage as well as the method then to disinfect and clean that water either going to our houses or coming back and cleaning it up. And as we do that, we see that there's more health concerns that we have as we're tying into supplies that may not be as a quality that we had in the past. We see that places are being salted in, our aquifers are not of the quality that they used to be. We're then pulling down deeper where we might find other minerals or other than elements that may be then hazardous to our health. And as we recycle more of this water and add it back into our water supply, not all of those things are being able to take out. So we may have more concern within the water quality that we may be getting to our home. We're going to run into droughts, and much of the United States has gone through droughts in recent times. And there have been re water restrictions where we cannot water plants outside. And so if I capture rainwater, I'll be able to utilize that. Then the reverse is also true. When we get into those times of very, very heavy rainfalls, we're adding to the flooding, the amount of pollution goes with that. So capturing rainwater can then allow me to reduce that demand. And so provide area, water in areas where there's not any water. The place that I built, and I want to show it to you in just a minute, uh, then was a place where the gentleman had bought the place out in the country. He drilled three wells where there was no water underground. And so I bought the place and then started building knowing I had no other supply of water. And we're seeing many places not only doing that because it then allows them to build where there may not, or the water wells have then gone and then they need to find some other source of water. Or then we look at then other options that are there. We're looking at reducing stormwater. Much of the east side of the United States where rainfall is much more prevalent, then I get much more runoff as I increase more impervious area by building more houses, building more streets and highways, making parking lots. And so I add to the amount of water that runs off that used to go back into the ground. Then it as does that, then it then adds more pollution by picking up more of that sediment, more of that oils and other things that will then wind up into our waterways, into our rivers, lakes, then all the way down to the Gulf and coast. Then it may be the, the rainwater purity when I look at it from other standpoint, that may be just what I want. I remember my mother always had a rain barrel from way, way back in the early 1900s. And she always used that to water her special plants that she had, always used that to water, wash her hair with. And we see today that many people want to use that, bring that water into their house because of the water quality, the lower pH, then it does not affect the fixtures as well as it did with some of our water that may be high and in certain minerals that really clogs up our pipelines. And so the water quality may be the reason that I want it. We call it the gold standard of water. And then it's the right thing to do. When I look at then where we are looking at a sustainable then universe and then nation, I've got to take care of our water supply. Not only our energy and the other inputs, I want to make a softer footprint on my place. By capturing, utilizing rainwater, I can do that. And so there's two ways of capturing rainwater. I'll primarily look at then the active or complex system where I have to have a roof, convey that water, put it into a storage tank, and then utilize it for some use inside or outside the house. But I also want to think about passive collection, where I capture it on the land in different ways, whether I'm in a residential location, put in rain gardens or other things, or in commercial locations where I have to do other things to really reduce the amount of stormwater runoff. EPA has really stepped in to make sure that we reduce that amount of runoff on our larger construction so that it's no, lo no larger amount of runoff after construction than it was before construction. And so our commercial buildings and much more of the larger excavations, and they're required to do those things that reduce the stormwater runoff, and that, so that's a good thing as well. Now, there's only one thing that I really want you to remember as far as numbers go. For every one square foot of roof, one inch of rain is approximately six-tenths of a gallon of water. 
is 0.623, then I round that down because of evaporation or spillage, that it may not all get into that storage tank. But if I look at 6 tenths as a good number to work with, if I had a 2,000 square foot root, it rained one inch, 2,000 times 0 0.6, would be 1,200 gallons of water that I could capture, 1,200 gallons with one inch of rain. Now you can multiply that by the amount that you get in your area, and in my area it's about 20 inches per year. And so off of a 2,000 square foot root, I could get 24,000 gallons of water per year. The picture at the bottom is where I'm at right now. I'm at the Menard County Library, and off to the east side of the building, I've got then a storage tank, a 2,000 gallon collection tank. In the back of the building, I've got then a rain garden. In the front, I have a storm chamber to capture the rest of the water and put it back into the ground. And so there's lots of different designs that we can do, and we'll get into that as we go through this process. Now, when I'm talking about that one square foot, I'm talking about then the trip line or the footprint of that building. It doesn't matter the shape of that roof, the slope of that roof. I'm really looking at water falling down and then falling off of that building. So I'm just looking at the length time to width to come up with a number that we're going to utilize in our calculation. I want to first just touch on my house. This is a picture of my house, and a, and a picture on the left is my front yard. Uh, you see there's not much uh, turf to be mowed in my place. Uh, and I have about 5,000 square foot of roof. I know I only live totally off of rainwater, so I have a small house, but I have a large porch all the way around my house, and then also then a, then a, a barn, which I have my garage, my workshop, uh, then my storage is also in there along with my greenhouse. So I catch the water off of my house. The water goes down from my downspouts. It actually goes down underground. It then goes across my yard and then goes over to where my barn is. And inside my barn, the water rises back up to go into that storage tank. We'll talk about how that works in just a minute. But you can see in my backyard, I like to have lots of plants to give me lots of color, lots of fragrance attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, other birds, and so I can sit out there and enjoy things in nature. These plants have been really adapted to my area, so they require much less water than turf does. And so I'm able then to capture not only off my house, off of my barn, but then store that water then for storage whenever I need it. This is inside my barn, so you can see that I have eight, and you only see a portion of these, eight 3,000-gallon polyethylene tanks. This then at the other end of that is my greenhouse, and I utilize the heat from my tanks during the wintertime to then help them insulate and then keep that room warmer so it takes less heat for me to keep my, all my plants growing. This is during the war summertime, so you don't see very many plants uh, in my greenhouse. But the top, uh, you see above those tanks is that blue line. That's carrying water then off of this barn in the one-storage tank. The tank, the taller tank on the left side, there's a black line, and that's water coming from my house that goes from my downspouts, goes down underground, rises up, and drops into the top of that tank. Then all these tanks are tied together. This is my landscaping. These are the things that I enjoy. I probably give hummingbirds more water than I do to my uh, plants that I have in my garden. We have many, many hummingbirds, and I get to enjoy those. And I like to sit and enjoy rather than to say, do I need to mow my turf? Do I need to take care of it another way? Take lots of inputs. And so I want to sit and enjoy things. My tanks are all tied together. Out at the bottom comes in a two-inch bulkhead fitting, uh, then a valve, then all my tanks are tied together with a one-and-a-half-inch line. And then from there it goes to my pump. All these tanks are also tied together at the top, so if that, that person overflows it in the second whenever it's full. I'd like to tell you today I've got 26,000 gallons in storage, and I am 100% full. We've just had two good rains, one back in June, and then one just last week that topped off my tanks, and then I had to open my valves and allow water to run on the ground. I've got my tanks full, which is a great feeling when you're in my, my condition. I have my water goes into a small pump house, then at the bottom of that, you see two lines that are coming out. One of those is going to my house with potable water that I can drink and utilize in my house. The other is a line that goes to all my drip irrigation that I utilize outside. 
And so the, the water that goes outside does not run through my filters and through my disinfection, but all the water that goes inside my house then is disinfected. I bring the water in. I have at the bottom there that black thing is a one horse pump that pumps water into then a 40 gallon pressure tank. From there it goes in through three filters, one very coarse filter, then a 20 micron filter, a 5 micron charcoal filter, and then from there it goes to an ultraviolet light, and then from there it goes straight to my house. And that's what we do. Uh, there's some things that we do. We screen that water before it gets into that storage tank. I do a purse flush. I wash that roof off that uh, I'm not going to explain today. I'm trying to make sure I get the best water into that storage tank. And then I take the water out, run through those filters, and UV light. And that's all we do. Uh, I do put chlorine in it as I flush the lines, but I change out the UV, change out my filters. I change out that UV once a year. But that's what we do at our house. We meter the water that goes into our house as well as it goes outside. Over the last six years, the amount of water that we use in our house, knowing that we have no other water supply, we can live off of less than five inches of rainfall a year. And people ask me what we do. I would say that we put in all the fixtures that use the least amount of water possible, but also we know how to turn the water off. And we don't use water unless we need to use it. And so our, wash, our dishwasher does our dishes, washes it for us. We don't then rinse them clean before we put it in. Uh, we lick them clean. No, we don't. Uh, we, we try to get them clean before we get in, but I don't utilize that water. We do not waste water. We just know that we have a finite amount of water, and we just become conservation-minded. That's the beauty of rainwater harvesting. We just learn that water is precious, and we don't need to waste it all. This is my landscaping in the back, and I enjoy getting out there and enjoying the things with that. I enjoy seeing a few things come up, and we enjoy the things in the wildlife that come as we're out in the rural area. And outside, we utilize almost as much water as we do inside of our house. And so if I could have then the amount of water that I need for irrigation outside and inside use, I need a close to nine inches of rainfall a year. In November 2010 to 2011, we had 5.5 inches during that 12-month period. I could tell lots of my irrigation outside, but at the end of that, when we finally got a rain, I still had a two-month supply of water in my storage tank. So I can live off of less than six inches of rainfall a year if that's something that I want to do or need to do. And so nearly in any place in the United States, I could live just as I am and have enough water to do exactly everything that I'm doing in my location. So this is my house. I like to see those thunderclouds coming. I enjoy the rainfall when it comes, uh, and then capture that in my landscape as well as off my roof, and so I have it available for me. I want to show you a passive collection. This is uh, right next to where I'm at right now in the library. This is where the old library was. And so we've taken the last year of taking a vacant lot and then installed in a collection tank that you see in the back off this pavilion. Then we put in lots of plants. We're actually bringing water in off of the street. This is during that rain event last week. For water that runs down the street, we are bringing part of that water into our garden. And so I have it available there and allow it to go back into the ground rather than continue to run off, add more than pollution as it goes down the street. I'm in a very re residential area here, so there's not a whole lot of pollution that I need to be concerned with. But this is getting water in there. I will eventually put more plants in that rain garden that really like that extra water. But around there, we've also got then 12 raised beds. All of this is under drip irrigation with the vegetables there that we are trying to grow with kids and trying to teach them that process. We put in the plants that are adapted. We put in lots of mulch so we don't have the evaporation. And then put in the right plants. It really gives us lots of beauty. It's full of, of uh, Butterflies, hummingbirds, other birds are in there right now. I have a bird water there that's coming from the, my rainwater collection tank that's dripping in to provide water for them. This is where I was a year ago, just as we started out. And this is where we are today. I have a keyhole garden. I have raised beds in there. I have lots of different plants in there to respond so I can teach the community how we can do this, reduce stormwater runoff. There's three rain gardens in this site, and then we use everything that's under drip irrigation. And so as we start looking then at how I do it passively, we call this low-impact development. 
where I try then to make the smallest footprint on that property and keep as much of that water on site, utilize as little as I need. Because we know but before we built this, go back in history, what this place looked like, 25% of that water should have gone down to reach Harker Aquifer. Some of that water is going to go in to take care of the plants. Very little of that water is going to run off, but it's going to leave slowly as it goes through all that vegetation there, filters it out. We're going to get that evapotranspiration by the plants that are going to be utilizing that. But when I put in then all of our impervious area, much, much more water is going to run off. Very little water gets back into the ground. We have then some shallow evapor or infiltration, but much more of that is going to leave our property. And so I've got to figure out how to mitigate that process there that I've sealed the land over, and I've got to take care of it. This is from Clemson University. This is before you put in that rain collection. Whenever it rains, the water's going to come off that roof. It's going to run off the land. Much of it's going to evaporate. We're going to get very little water back into the ground. But if I can put in that rain collection tank, that rain barrel, put in the rain gardens and do those things, then when it rains, I can capture that water. And then when it gets hot and dry and I need that water, I can put it in that rain garden, put it into other plants. That's going to help move more water back into the ground, a lot less evaporation. And so I can be able to utilize that. So we're looking into a new era in water management. So let's look at this here. What do we do? We pay water to bring it in. We also pay to get rid of that water as our wastewater. And then we pay to get rid of the free water and star water fees, all that water that leaves our property uh, in that process. So I want to think about here before we have this here, all this water just runs into our property unlimited. But if I put in a collection tank then, I capture a finite amount of water that's going to help me in for a period of time. And then after that, then I can go back with a municipal water supply and that's where we're going to require less of that in the long term, whether I use it inside the house or utilize it outside the house. So there's three approaches to rainwater harvesting I want to think about. One is to be able to capture water so I can use it for irrigation to water different things, and we'll talk about how to use that water in a minute. But I can also use it as a stormwater control. I can capture it and then release it slowly but quickly into the area around me, going into the rain gardens, going into then other structures, to reduce the amount of storm water. But I can also then have it where I can have an outlet so the top half of that water I'm going to release fast to be part of my storm water. But the bottom of that, I can utilize it not only then for outside use, inside use, but also in there are certain locations in the United States, they require that you have rainwater available for fire protection. So I can have that bottom part for the fire department to use, or I can utilize in for a purpose, for my own purpose, or then for also then for fire protection. So there's different reasons, different ways that I can capture and utilize that water. When I talk about rainwater harvesting, I want us to think about I'm capturing water from above the ground off of an impervious surface. That's get it. That's real important because when in water hits the ground, there's lots more impurities that can get into that water supply where it's going to contaminate us that leave from our parking lots, our streets, or off of my vegetation. And then as that water runs off, I can capture that, but I want to consider that stormwater harvested. And then rainwater is above ground where it has not come in contact with those others. So we look at residential then wastewater. And we talk about gray water or gray water, different, how, different ways of spelling it or saying it. They all mean the same. And this is water that I could then reuse. And it could Depending on your local location, I can capture from uh, showers, bathtubs, wash, hand washing lavatories, certain sinks, or then my washing machines. And then when we start looking at recycle, reuse this water, that is that gray water that I can use. Taking it from my sink, run it into the commode. Take it from a washing machine and go and utilize it, use that for irrigation. Rainwater is not recycled water. It's not reclaimed water. It's not reused water. It is a primary source of water. That's never been used before. And so I want to make sure we keep that definition apart because there's too many who wants to pull rainwater into those other definitions. And so I can have my rainwater collection. It may not have to look like a rainwater collection tank, but I can have my water available there to utilize for lots of different purposes. So the first thing we know, we, you know that you measure and cap, capture water into the, your rain gauges, but then looking at how much I could capture, it is different all across the United States. 
when we look in Denver, those uh, state those uh, months that are in red is when they get the most rainfall. They are right in the peak of that now in Denver. Getting that uh, those wildfires were way back uh, earlier during that rainfall season, but they're in the monsoon season right now. But you look at what they're going to get in February, January, November, December. Very, very little rainfall. Look at Atlanta, Georgia. They get nearly three times as much rain almost. And you look at their rainfall, that red in January, July, March, all of those months. They get lots of rain on the east side of the United States, and it's going to come very regular as well as have a lots of rainfall. That adds to the amount of stormwater runoff but make it a whole lot easier to capture rain and then utilize it rather than that municipal water supply to irrigate with. But look on the West Coast. If you look at during that summertime compared to Denver, they don't get any rain right now. They're in a dry time. July, they would expect not to get any rainfall and not expect to get it till November. So you got to know your location. When do I need to capture water and when do I need to utilize it? This is a map of the United States. The purple is when they capture the most rainfall uh, during the summertime. The areas there are in red, orange, and yellow is when they capture most of it during the winter time. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we need to look at that when that rain comes and when to use it. Now I need to calculate how much I need to know how much storage that I need. And so I need to know the rainfall amount. I got to have to know the size of my roof to be able to calculate how much then's coming off there. Then I got to need how much I'm going to need for my plants, flush my toilet with, whatever it is. And I'll talk about rain intensity and rain frequency in a minute, but that rain frequency tells me then how long those dry periods are going to be. If it's going to be dry one month, I may only need to capture a little water. If I've got three or four months, I need to have lots of storage there. And so that's going to dictate then the size of storage that I need to make the needs that I'm going to have. Then is there a backup supply? At my house, I have no backup supply. And so I need to have enough to meet me for my needs for 12 months. You may need just to be able to capture some, but knowing that you have another backup supply so you don't have to have your total amount in storage. On the, on the end of this year, I've got some calculators that are on some websites. This is from the Texas Water Development Board. I'm not going to go through those, but to help you understand that on the right side tells you at the end of the month, based upon what I put in, size of storage, my demand, then how much I'm going to have left in that storage tank to help me balance that out. This is one that I have on Texas A&M University website that gives you a three year in graph form as well as in the amount in numbers that you can go to that website and be able to pull that up and get those numbers. Now the other thing I need to look at is rain intensity. It is different all across the United States. I can go up close to the west coast in uh, Alaska. The rain intensity may only be about one inch per hour per hour, and they get over 100 inches per year. El Paso is 2 inches per hour, and that equates into 0 0.021 gallons per minute per square foot. Tucson's 3 inches per hour, that's 0 0.031. San Antonio's 4.4 inches per hour, that equates into 0 0.036 gallons per minute per square foot. And so if I had a 1,000 square foot roof, in San Antonio, I multiply 1,000 by 0 0.036, come up with 36 gallons per minute would be coming off that roof. So I have numbers there all across the United States to give you an idea of what it is and then use that and then measure it. In Denver, it's 2.2 .2 inches per hour or 0 0.023 gallons per minute per square foot. On a 1,000 square foot roof, that's 23 gallons per minute would be coming off. And so that's what I need to know in sizing the gutters, making sure the water comes off that roof, gets into those gutters, then also then the downspouts, and then the pipe that goes to that collection tank. I've got to know then what size they need to be to get that water in that storage tank. So these are numbers that will help us in, based upon that rain intensity, what we need to do. Now collecting tanks, we can start out like this. And I'm sure some of you have done that. I don't want to show of hands, but I know some of you have done that. I've I've done that at my house. Uh, but well, then we can get into rain barrels. Now, one rain barrel is called the gateway drug to rainwater harvesting. Let's get us started in that process. I can even have my own storage, but then have my own roof above that. This is a rain saucer that pumps water in that storage tank. Each one of these saucers is about 10 square feet. If I got a one-inch rain 
on that one saucer, 10 square feet times 0.6 gallons for every square foot for one inch. So 0.6 times 10, I would get six gallons into that storage tank. The one on the left has two of those. I'd get 12 gallons for every inch of rainfall just off of these saucers. And so it would only take about three or four inches to fill up this rain barrel uh, that I could utilize. So I could have it as maybe my focal point in my backyard if that's something I want to do. And I can expand that to help them to grow into the garden if I don't have a roof there available to me. And so we start with one rain barrel. We're addicted, and we start adding to it. This gentleman has 37 in their backyard. So they've grown past their need. I can have them very pretty ones if I want to to get that water into it. Uh, this is a, certainly a nice uh, pot that could go in my backyard. But I see many locations where we're putting it in, make it where it matches the landscape. I can put it down below ground, and we'll talk about below ground uh, structures here in just a minute. And I can use it. This house is almost a million dollar house. There's a 40,000 gallon collection tank. That is their sole source of water in there. And so I can do that. That's something I want to do. Now the first thing I've got to do and think about them capturing water, I've got to have a roof. And I've got to get that water into that storage tank. And so depending on where you are, you may get it from different locations. Top left and top right is both in the Fairbanks, Alaska, where I was back in March where they store their water on their roof all during the wintertime. Then when it starts melting in the spring, they can get that water into their storage tank and utilize it during the summer when they're trying to grow most of their vegetables and to take care of them different needs that they have. I capture off my greenhouse. I capture off different types of roofs. For outside use, I'm not concerned what the roofing material is. I can bring it inside. My preference is to have a metal roof, but a composition roof, tile, other materials can be utilized even for inside portable uses if we want to do that. I'm not going to get to, into it deep, but uh, we can utilize that. I'd like to wash the roof off a little bit better and then understand then the water quality and the things I need to do. Now I've got to get it off of that roof and get it into my storage tank. We can use rain chains. I can use regular conveyance. Uh, the bottom right our picture there is uh, I make it a little more attractive if I want to to get that water into my rain barrel. Now, there's things that's going to wind up on that roof, and I want to make sure that I don't get it into that storage tank, and that's where I'd like to wash that roof off. Now, that bird droppings at the top, if I'm using this for irrigation, that may just be fertilizer and not be as much of a problem. But leaves and organic matter, if I get too much in that storage tank, it will start rotting. And as it does, it pulls oxygen out of that water, and then it becomes anaerobic or septic. Most of our anaerobic bacteria are our harmful bacteria that can hurt us. And so I want to make sure we get good water in there and that it does not turn septic. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through. But I want to be able to screen these out. And so there's different products that are available, some very simple, some more complicated. But all of these here are designed in to screen out the bigger materials and get it very fine. I like for it to be fine enough that it will not allow a mosquito to pass through as a minimal, and then we can get in a finer product. This is my wife's parents. They grew up, uh, and my wife grew up just north of Louisville, Kentucky, Salem, Indiana. Uh, this is their water coming off of their roof. It's this metal plate, Then there's about a foot of sand underneath there, and then that goes through a membrane, and it goes into the storage that they have underneath in the basement of their house. This was the way my wife grew up on rainwater. This was their source of water. Very fine filtration, making that water much, much cleaner as it went into that storage tank. These are things that were caught in a basket as water went through a basket going in that storage tank. These are catkins or pollen and leaves that were coming off of trees that wind up on that roof in that gutter, then wind up into that storage tank if I do not have a screen to catch it out. This is that same basket, but it's in the fall. That's full of crickets and ground beetles. And I assure you that does not smell good. And I want to make sure that does not get into my storage tank or get into the water in that storage tank. There's other devices that are there. Some of them then are more sophisticated, more expensive than others. Some are designed to capture lots of water and filter it before it goes in that storage tank. So there's different products that you've got to match your need then on the demand that you have. Now getting the water off of that roof, I'd like to get it to go straight in that storage tank. And that's on the left, it's called a dry line. So all the water drains off that roof to go into that storage tank. 
One on the right is this what we call a wet system, where the water would go down, go wherever I wanted to, and put that rain barrel in my barn, behind the trees, in my garage, some other location. I could put it right in the garden if I wanted to, right where I'm going to utilize that water, allow the water to go down, go across, rise up, to go in that storage tank. Water will stay in that line at where it enters that tank all the way across to the side of the building if I do not have a drain in it. That's why it's called a wet line. My goal is to put a drain on that, and I'll show you that in this example. This is in El Paso, the largest desalinization plant in the interior of the United States. The bottom right, I'm going to put a collection tank on the side of that white building to capture water off of one downspout of about 20 downspouts on this building. So this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be a 1,500-gallon tank. Uh, it's a polyethylene tank that I'll show you in just a minute. But I put some wood around it to give it a different look, put some metal strapping around it. And I'm going to use it to go to a bird bath that's into the tree on the far left side. There's the bird bath over there. In the next picture, you won't be able to see that. But I'm going to take it. I'm going to take from that one primary roof drain, put it into this storage tank. So I'm going to slide these into that. I'm going to go across to where I have a step down so nobody trips over it. And then I'll paint that. But then I'm going to go down, go across, rise up, go into that storage tank through the top. And there'll be a screen basket up in the top. And then the, the bottom right picture is going to be my overflow where I'll take that, send it back into the rain gardens that they have at this side. And so as I was finishing putting the wood slats around here, you can see I use strapping and slide these wood slats around it, then I'll strap it. But I could hear thunder coming, so I grabbed up my tools, started to leave, but decided I better stay, take a picture. This is about a 10-minute rain event. And you can see it's already started to rain when I took this first picture. Then the water really came down from the sky, very rain intense when you look at this here. But it's only about a 10-minute rain event. And then, the, then as this is that drain that I have on my wet line, you see that I have then a plug. I've left it loose at this point. I'll drill a hole in it later so it drains all the water out of that wet line so I don't have the water standing in there either then to be exposed or then to then potential for freezing. So this is how I drain that wet line in that process. So this is a cloud left. I have a rainbow you can see there already. Water's coming off around the buildings, running into this rain garden. So I go around to the next downspout. The water's running out on the ground. Come back to mine. I had eight ten I had six tenths of an inch of rain. I caught eight hundred gallons off this one downspout off that six tenths inch of rain this one downspout. So then uh, I grabbed, got my pickup, drove away. This is the first street that I come to. That's the American way of getting in water off my roof, get it off my yard, get it into the street or to the drain, storm drains as fast as I can. So I had to buy municipal water to irrigate with or then take water from a well next week. And so I want us to think about this water. I'm going to use this for a bird bath. Uh, that top is a dragonfly, that black head is a drip emitter, and I'm going to have it dripping one drop a second. So I want to know how long this 800 gallons is going to last if I have it dripping here one drop a second. So I need to know how many drops are in a gallon of water for an average size drop. Now, you, most of you should know about that since you capture those rain drops. But one gallon is approximately then 90,000 drops of water. So if I have it dripping one drop a second and I've got 90,000 drops, I need to know how many seconds are in a day. I had a group from Brazil. I had a, over 125 students at uh, a facility close to me yesterday. And I asked those students how many seconds are in a day. And within 30 seconds, one of those students calculated there's 86,400 seconds in a day. Amazing that we have such bright students today. So if, uh, what I'm trying to say, if I have it dripping one drop a second, I use about one gallon per day. 800 gallons will last about 800 days. I have way too much water off that one downspout. If you start multiplying that by 20, and how much I would have caught off of. And so we see in many of our places, many of our counties, cities, putting in storage. 
This is north of Dallas. There's four 15,000 gallon collection tanks utilized capturing water off that building. They have rain garden, they have impervious pavement. They utilize this in turf with subsurface drip irrigation. Uh, we find in the bank next to them also has to do that to keep up with the county. Then there's lots of different options of what we're going to look at in collection tanks. We'll talk about those again in a minute. So make it then where they're more attractive to fit our personal needs and capture the amount of water that I need. I might even have it as a big turtle in my backyard if I want to. That's a fiberglass tank, a 10,000 gallon tank. So lots of different products that are out there. I can go below ground. In northern climates, many of us are going to install a system below ground so I don't have to worry about freezing. There's other products that are out there. These are crates that you put together and then wrap it up so that I fold up in an impervious slicer so I hold and those, those storage then containers give me storage. I can use concrete in that process. And then I can use other new products. Here's a 4 million gallon storage collection tank. Uh, then using new products that are out there available to us. As we look at close, close, cold climate sin, I need to understand that water then comes off and it needs to be protected or it's going to freeze. But we live in areas where there may be then, and I have to get that piping down deeper. There's going to be a snowfall in certain areas as well. So this here sort of gives us a guide of how deep that water needs to be so it does not freeze. This is a frost line. It's pretty deep when I get into Fairbanks, Alaska, where they have this water going into the different places. They're storing it above ground. But if I have any piping, it may not hurt the water in a storage tank in most locations, but all the piping needs to be protected or it will break. So there's different ways to do it from freeze protection, putting the tanks down below ground, making sure that piping then uh, drains water into it. There's different resources out there. This is one then from, the, uh, from Alaska that you can get information from that shows you how to install the tank so they are protected, give me some insulation. And there's things I can put in there as well to keep it from freezing uh, if I need to. Now I'm going to look at utilizing this rainwater. And so I'll try to finish up here fairly quick. This is my wife's parents. Totally off of rainwater their place then for many, many years. They also had a dairy. They utilized rainwater off their barn to then uh, wash out their big water and to take care of them from the livestock there. I can use it for drip irrigation. Very, very simple, easy way to do. I can do lots of things with gravity flow drip irrigation. I take a 20-gallon rain barrel with me wherever I go. I take a soaker hose. I take then this poly pipe like this. I will take a bird bath. I take a, then a watering device for pets. Uh, and I'll hook them all up, and they will work then with gravity flow. That soaker hose, it has a little then cap on the inside with a little bit of hole in it. i got to take it out if I want to use it by gravity flow. But I can do that, and it will work very effectively. This is a building that uh, when I came to, you can see in the far background, there was a small, let me back up, there's a small five-gallon bucket in the back. They use that to water the plants on the porch. We're going to gutter this building. We're going to take the downspouts, as you can see, already painted in green, go down underground, go into a 5,000-gallon collection tank. All this is under drip irrigation, gravity flow from that storage tank to supply for this uh, center uh, that we have there. We see at different locations where we utilize it to water plants with, any commercial facility. This is a greenhouse to provide them for these, uh, for these plants as well. We're doing it in many places to provide for wildlife and use it then uh, also then for hummingbirds. It's another picture of hummingbirds at my place. There's five of these feeders out there. They're all looking like this right now because we've got lots of babies that are coming to the feeder now. This is a bird bath that's going to mine, dripping about a drop a second, uh, just showing you that I can then have this water dripping off, provide for birds. Fun to watch then, see how these birds then utilize it. I can utilize it for livestock supplement livestock. On our website talks about uh, then uh, publication on how much water livestock need uh, and so give you better help on that. There are 16 horses at this location, totally all for rainwater. These are ducks, guineas, chickens drinking rainwater, their only source of water. I did it with drip irrigation. These are examples of here. This is dripping irrigation with gravity flow. Uh, the bottom one is uh, has a pump on it and the pump there, the storage tanks in the back. Here's gravity flow drip irrigation. We can use it for fire department. This is one in uh, far west Texas, McDonald Observatory. We're going to catch off the backside of their parking lot strictly for fire protection. There's a screen in here. We've got a uh, screen. We've got a quick connect for the fire department. That's that same facility just over two years ago. It helped protect this place 
from burning it up. I can use it in home, and I'll try to finish up here where I can use it and bring it inside the house. The thing I want to think about, I want to make sure I keep mosquitoes out. I want to keep sunlight out of my rain barrel. And then I want to be able to make sure you understand that's not safe water to drink in that rain barrel. I have to disinfect it because there are things in there that you do not see that also contaminants are in there. So I want to make sure I filter it fine and then disinfect it in a suitable manner. I can distill. I can use reverse osmosis, chlorine, UV light, which is what most of us use that drink rainwater. Our ozone is also very popular as well. Rainwater is slightly acidic, so I'd like to raise it up, especially in certain areas where you know where your pH may be very, very low. Uh, it will dissolve copper uh, if it is real, real low over time. And so I can raise it up very simple, uh, either by using baking soda or then adding then a filter with then uh, a device in to raise the pH up if I want to. So think about a rain barrel. Again, I want to make sure that then I am uh, keeping mosquitoes out, I'm keeping sunlight out, or algae is going to grow. Then also understand that it's not safe to drink. And so otherwise, I want to think about the whole picture. I want you to think about every drop that comes off your plate. Teddy Roosevelt said about 100 years ago that a nation behaves well. If it treats the natural resources as an asset. It must turn over to the next generation increase, not impaired in value. And so I hopefully that this is going to instill into you that you want to do this, that you want to do your part, and we all can. And then we can get to where we are, then the Joneses, and everyone else is trying to keep up with us. At the bottom in the green, or is it a website then from uh, Texas and, and University on rainwaterharvesting.tamu.edu. The ARCSA is our, also the site where I do training. I train installers. I train then people that want to inspect rainwater collection systems. I do a two-day class as well then for those that want to do actual construction. And you can find where we're doing that at different uh, sites across the United States. And then I'm helping them with other nations as well the best I can to help them improve their water quality and quantity that they have. So with that, I want to thank you very much for listening to me this morning. Uh, certainly you can email me with questions over time. I get calls or I get emails of people that uh, once they start then run into a problem. I'd be glad to help you at any time, whether it's going to be this week or two years from now. And so with that, I I'll turn it back over to Henry uh, and see where we go from here. Billy, thank you very much. Very informative uh, presentation there. A lot, of, a lot of good things we can learn from that. Uh, those references Billy made, we have those listed on our Coco Ross website on the Weather Talk. So uh, you can just go to there and click on those, and, and they'll take you to those different sites. Uh, we've got some questions coming in. If you do have any for Billy, go ahead and type them in now. We'll try in the next 20 minutes or so to answer as many as we can. Uh, here's one here that uh, somebody wanted to know on your site, what did all the tanks, et cetera, of your water system cost? So to have something like that, what are they looking at as cost-wise? Okay. The cost of the storage, which is the biggest cost, is anywhere from 30 cents per stored gallon all the way up, up to $1 to $2 per stored gallon. Most of our polyethylene tanks are going to cost us in that 50 to a dollar per stored gallon. I've got a collection tank uh, on my cabin up in Cloudcroft, New Mexico at 9,600 feet. I wanted to put a 500-gallon tank in because we just don't stay there very often. 500-gallon tank is going to cost me $500. A 1,000-gallon tank is going to cost me $625. That 500-gallon tank was a dollar per stored gallon. That 1,000-gallon tank is on 62 and a half cents per gallon. So the price goes down as we get into larger storage. Uh, I have 25,000 gallons in storage uh, today then that's, that cost me around 40 cents per stored gallon. So there's about 10,000 gallons, $10,000 in storage. All my pumps, my filters, and UV cost me about $1,200 all total. And so I'm looking at then twelve to $15,000, but that's putting it in myself. Uh, and a lot of this you can do yourself, but uh, whenever I look at hiring someone then to install it, uh, you may not need near as much storage as I do. Biggest cost is in that storage. The filter you be there is going to be twelve to two thousand uh, dollars, and uh, and you can get some help in installing those. So uh, I say for someone that wants to live totally off of rainwater and have someone else install it, I'd like for them to say I'd like to have twenty thousand dollars. 
Many places in the United States, that's about the cost of what it takes to drill a well. Uh, I can do off less money than that, but I have a little less storage in that process. One thing I did forget to bring up, and I wanted to mention that, is looking at the, where I can collect rainwater. Uh, in different states, they have different rules, especially the western United States. The western water laws are then a little bit different. Oregon used to say that you could not capture rainwater. Now they say you can capture rainwater until it touches the ground. When it touches the ground, it belongs to the state. So you can capture off of above the ground or even something that's impervious above ground or right at the ground and then funnel that water into a storage tank. And many of them are doing that for irrigation purposes. But uh, so once it touches ground, it belongs to the state. In the state of Colorado, the water that falls on your roof may not be your water. There are some rules in there that allow rainwater capture if you have an old grandfathered well in your location, at your location, you can capture rainwater. But otherwise, that water's already been claimed or been given away uh, then for people downstream to have those water rights, and then it may not be yours then to capture. So you need to know in the state where you are. The state of Washington also used to not allow capture rainwater. Now they also do that now. So you need to make sure in which state you are, what rules. Eastern United States, most of them then really want you to manage stormwater. There are stormwater fees along the east coast that if you allow water to leave your property, there's going to be a tax or a fee associated with that. Uh, Maryland, I believe it was, I was reading something, they call that a rainwater tax, the water that's going to be a fee that's going to be charged you if you allow that to leave your property. So there's incentives in, in other locations there to capture rainwater. Thanks, Billy. We've got a lot of questions coming in, so we'll try to get to as many as we can here uh, as, we, as we go along. Um, let's see, we've got uh, the advantages of a dry line versus a wet line, somebody was asking. Yeah, I, my preference is I have a dry line, so water all drains into it. The, the advantage of a wet line allows me to put that cream barrel or a storage tank right where I want to use that water. If I have a garden that's out there 30 feet away, I could put my rain barrel or my storage tank right where that garden is, let that water go down, go across over there, and then have it then so I could easily gravity flow irrigate at that location. It gets it out of sight. When you drive up to my place, you do not see a storage tank. You have no idea that I'm on rainwater unless you really look and then walk into my rain barn. So it gives me that then out of sight, out of mind. A lot of us don't want to have that rain barrel stuck right next to our house. This gives me that option to put that rain barrel in another location. On our website is a formula that tells me how big that pipe needs to be based upon how big the roof is, then how far I'm going to go away, called a Hazen-Williams formula uh, that will help you in calculating how big it needs to be based upon if I want to put it 100 yards away from my house. I can do that. Or if I have very little elevation difference where it goes into my storage tank versus where my gutter is, then this will help me do that calculation. So it's on that uh, uh, a &M University website. You know, uh, on the same subject there, uh, the, so for the outdoor tanks, uh, Ginny writes, is there a disadvantage or an advantage to tank color, so light versus dark? Is that anything to do there? Yes, yes, there is. I had a graduate student that did his work measuring a temperature of water in tanks of different color. And his study found that a black polyethylene tank in full shade the temperature of the water is co is hotter than a white tank in full sun. So the color does make a difference. The other thing is I want to make sure sunlight does not get in. Oftentimes we'll find in white rain barrels or, or tanks that uh, may be white that will allow water to without the sunlight to get in. If I can get in there and look inside and it still looks bright, there's enough light to get in that algae is going to grow that's going to plug up then my faucet or my drip irrigation. So color does make a difference. My preference is to make it attractive. Make the color then blend in then with wherever I'm putting it. In the garden, paint it like a garden. If it's next to the house, paint it the same color as whatever the building or the trim is. I want to make it attractive. I don't want to hear about a blue barrel or a white barrel. I want it to be in a very attractive barrel. So I feel very proud of it. Uh, then as well. 
Uh, Kay wants to know if the cost uh, goes up with the change of the color of the tank. So does that does that does that Most figure in? Most of our tanks uh, that you're going to find uh, for potable water, and I want it to be then made of virgin virgin plastic, and also then stamped on there for potable water. Uh, most of them are going to come in black. When I get into smaller tanks, there are lots of different companies now that are making different shapes, different sizes, different designs, and then making them in different colors. One company that makes gutters in 26 colors is now trying to make collection tanks up to 200 gallons in 26 different colors. And so we are seeing this is coming on because in our market is growing. You see rain barrels off different shapes, designs as well. Uh, same way with larger collection tanks. So they're getting into that same way as oil right now. Billy, uh, a, a, a viewer wants to know is where can they find, is there a website about the laws about catching rainwater in their state? So is there a national um, site they can go to to find out what, what happens in their state, if it's legal or not? Uh, the Extension Service in most states, uh, the Land Grant University usually knows. Uh, also, we are trying to put together some, and we have some on that ARCSA, A-R-C-S-A dot O-R-G website. Uh, there's a gentleman in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, I believe it's uh, Water H2O, that is trying to do that as well on his website to give you information there, uh, and also a very nice website to go to uh, on that site. Uh, otherwise, we really need to then uh, go to our state engineer that may then dictate what can be done, what cannot be done. Uh, and so then that in Texas, the Texas Water Development Board, or Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, EPA, also then uh, may be uh, able to give you information on that. Okay, Richard writes, and he wants to know if he catches uh, rainwater off a wood shingle metal roof barn, uh, does he need to do something to make it safe for livestock to use? Most of our, when we start looking at new wood shingles, they are then uh, impregnated with a fire retardant. Most of that is a phosphorus-based uh, fire retardant. Uh, but that's, or they also may be stained with some tannins or some kind of coloring that also gives them a prettier look as well. Uh, new shingles, then I would be a little bit more concerned far as livestock, I don't know that there's anything I cannot, phosphorus is something that livestock usually are deficient in, that we give uh, phosphorus supplements to livestock. The tannins are something they're going to be eating in many of the plants and leaves that they're going to be getting. So I don't know that there's anything to say that it would not be safe. Uh, I have a tendency to tell you I'd like for it to be an older wood shingle that then has allowed lots of this to wash off before I put it in the livestock. Uh, but I don't know of any reasons or of any tests that would tell you uh, that we could not then for livestock or for irrigation purposes. Now for a home system, Dave in Arizona wants to know if does the health department have to approve the system before it can it can be used? Now EPA looks at then water wells and no one is testing water wells to see if you're drinking water from that water well that's safe. Uh, there may be some locations, some water districts that do that, but then nationwide or in most states, no one tests their well. And they like to then associate rainwater collection as if it is your private well. Uh, and so we, there is not any. When I get into municipalities and then start looking at it, uh, there may be some then local requirements in that, uh, but overall, there is not. Uh, you are your own uh, guardian of the water quality that's in your storage tank. And I like to encourage those that install systems to develop a, op, a maintenance program with you so that they do the testing. They check to make sure everything is working right. And so they do lots of that. We are tendency to be lazy, so we don't uh, do the maintenance like we need to. So I try to encourage uh, and there are lists of those people all across the United States that are, that are on that ARCSA website that you can find in a professional there that's been trained then and understands how to install and maintain that system. Okay, uh, Adrian from Ar Oregon wants to know about the water min the mineral content of rainwater. She said she heard that you can get mineral deficiencies for drinking rainwater because there's not that much in it. 
Yes, I, when I do some talks, uh, I, I will mention that uh, there's three things that uh, are then a problem with rainwater. Uh, one is, you look at my hair, it's sort of turned white since I've been drinking rainwater so long. Uh, the other thing is that there is not the minerals in it. Uh, I want a good diet, but I also now take uh, regularly those minerals, especially calcium, phosphorus, uh, and potassium, and magnesium uh, that I haven't in the past. I've gotten a little more leg cramp. Uh, I don't know whether that's old age or inherited, but I also then uh, I take those. So I, I, I do think that taking that mineral uh, is a good thing if I'm going to drink exclusively rainwater or primarily rainwater. Okay, Mark in Hawaii. Now, that third reason, I forgot to tell you the third reason. Uh, the third re reason is it affects your memory. Uh, very good. Uh, Mark in Hawaii wants to know, what is the best pH for your catchment water? He says, at what, point, uh, what pH point does copper piping beneath, uh, or copper piping begin to deteriorate? I don't know exactly how long. Uh, my pH of my water is uh, 6.1, 6.3. Uh, I have copper sinks and a little bit of copper. I have not seen any uh, then fouling or then, uh, then degradation in that. I think when we get below six, I really need to be conscious of that. I know in Hawaii that there are many locations uh, with the volcano that we have sulfur up in the air, uh, and then I may get that pH way down into below five, even into the four range. Uh, that, I certainly want to raise that pH. Uh, I guess uh, when you look at municipalities, all of them would like to keep the pH above seven, if at all possible. And I think many of them keep it in seven and a half, even up to eight, making sure that they don't have it. Because many old houses have lots of old copper in it. Uh, and so they're going to keep it above stuff. Um, and I don't have then scientific information to tell you that below seven uh, is acceptable. I just tell you that's what I do at my house. Uh, I have not added anything to raise my pH up. Uh, and mine's been in that uh, little over six range. Okay, Chandra writes, and he wants to know, what advice do you have for him to contract a plumber to install a system uh, for a client who has hired him? So I guess if you're having a plumber doing this, what, what advice would you you'd have? Uh, the thing here in Texas is that uh, we allow plumbers to install systems if there's a municipal water backup that I could use rainwater, my primary source of water in the state of Texas in the cities, but then use municipal water as a backup. The thing about plumbers, they do not understand then the water quality going into that storage tank. And so I, uh, in Texas, I, my preference is to train all plumbers so they understand then all the dynamics designed uh, in from gutters to get into that storage tank water quality uh, and then uh, also the disinfection. Most of them know that end of it or then can learn that, but they need someone to train the licensed plumber then how to install systems correctly. Uh, and so we have then installers that will contract with a licensed plumber to do the work that's inside the house or put in the disinfection, and they will do all the other work. So it's, it's become a team uh, in Texas in many places there that we need that partnership, someone to do the electricity, someone then to do the system, and someone else to do then the plumbing that goes into the house in the disinfection. Okay, uh, Eric in Colorado says he's got a lot of pollen. It's a major issue here, I'm sure, across a lot of parts of the the country. What is the best pollen filter for irrigation, or is it even necessary? And then uh, to add to that, Jim from Oregon writes, and how often do you need to change the filters on your system? So two questions here. One about the best pollen filter, and uh, Jim wants to know how often do you need to change the filters? Okay. Uh, pollen is a problem. At my house, during the time, and I have primarily live oak trees, during the time that pollen is falling, I will not put water in my collection tank. I let all that water go on the ground rather than going into my tank because there is not a fine enough screen that really allows that pollen to be captured and go uh, without it going into that storage tank. The best way to do that, and I, and I worked with a gentleman in Alaska, that we you saw the one that uh, is a large box with a foot of sand in it with a metal plate on top of it. 
I could have that go into that, land on that metal plate, go through that sand, and that's going to be the best way to keep the pollen out. It will stay in that top one to two inches, and at the end of that year or that season, you can rake it out and then, then dispose of that. Uh, but it is the best way of taking out then, uh, this gentleman is taking water off of a pond where there's lots of very, very small uh, particles that was getting into his irrigation system. And so that was the best way to do that. Uh, certainly you can put filters on your irrigation line, the catcher, and uh, get those out. But it's better before it ever goes in that storage tank. Now, when I want to change filters, it all depends on then the type of roots that I have, the type of uh, materials that get in there to change, that clogs up those filters. At my place, I wash the roof off before I put water into that storage tank. I change out my filters once a year. Same time I change out my ultraviolet light. It needs to be changed out once a year. If I'm in a location where I'm not doing that, and I have then lots of pollen for a long period of time where I may have of pine trees at one time, oak trees at another, pecan trees and others where I have a longer season of then lots of pollen in the air, I may have to change out more often. We know at our house that we need to change it when the water flow flows down. Uh, and that's a good indicator. They are then their monitors or then uh, uh, then meters on each gate or gauges on each filter that tells you where it's poor, fair, or good that will give an indication that I need to change that filter out. You can also buy and put on top of your filter. Okay, Billy, here's another one. We're, we'll, we'll try to take as many questions as we can here. We're going to go a little long today just to try to get these in. Um, here's a, a person that writes, the, uh, the rainwater they, they use is for irrigation only. Is a first flush diverter necessary or is proper screening su sufficient? Uh, no, I do not think a first flush is necessary. It is a maintenance job. I like it when it goes into my house for potable uses. And I like to do it outside, but I tend to say uh, no. Proper screening is good enough. If your water becomes septic or aerobic, then you may need to add that first flush or get into a finer screen or then look at ways to improve water quality in that tank, uh, recirculating that water, uh, stirring it up, adding oxygen to it will help improve water quality, recirculating it in that where I can get more oxygen in that water is good. Uh, first flush is a maintenance problem, especially for irrigation. I tend to not do it, uh, but understand if I run into problems, that may be a uh, help for me uh, if I run into an issue. Okay, Lyndon in New Mexico writes, uh, can I use ordinary buckets? I know you showed pictures of those for getting started. Is the, what advice do you have some, for someone using ordinary buckets? Yeah, or, ordinary buckets certainly can be used. The problem is mosquitoes get in there very, very quickly. And I would like to either have it screened so that mosquitoes cannot get into it. Also, if they're open where sunlight can get into it, if I store it in for a very long period of time, algae is going to start growing into it. I can capture in buckets and then carry it and dump it into another storage tank where sunlight cannot get in, mosquitoes cannot get in. And so it's a way to get us started, uh, but understand that water then is going to then create problems if I don't use it very quickly uh, in the process. So it's a good way to capture it, but I then I'll either want to transfer it into another store, storage tank or then carry it to either my swimming pool or then into my uh, then koi pond or other things like that, depending on what I want to use that water for. So uh, understand the water that you have and then uh, uh, make sure I keep the mosquitoes and sunlight out. Okay, here's Jim from Kansas City he wants to know, have you heard of any efforts to engineer porous concrete or asphalt to allow rainfall to seep into the soil more naturally rather than becoming runoff into storm drains? Yes, that's, that is done, and it's done in a number of different places. I was in a place in Atlanta, Georgia, where they had then their walkway for all that pervious pavement, the rain garden right to the outside of that to allow that to percolate into that rain garden. Uh, that's what I want us to do. Uh, I think then pervious pavement, looking at then all these rain gardens, bioswales, uh, other type of methods then to get that water, keep it on site, and get it to where it needs to go is important. So that pervious pavement uh, definitely should be part of the solution. 
uh, managing my total water demand and supply. Dave writes that he's off the grid, uh, he's solar powered, and UV filtration is difficult. Uh, what do you know about ceramic whole house filtration, submicron? What could you tell him? Yeah, the, the ceramic filters definitely do a, an effective job. Uh, there are other methods. I've just bought a, a gravity flow chlorine infection disinfection methods so that uh, in locations around the world where they don't have electricity, uh, this is an option that I use tablets that then dissolve at a certain rate uh, in those locations. Uh, ceramic filters definitely do a very good job. There are some others that are out there now get it into that very fine uh, filtration. The problem is getting in enough water to meet my needs for my shower or then other needs as well. So I have to have a large ceramic filter or at least make sure I have that then for the water that I'm going to ingest. Uh, there are other options that are out there. There are some sand filters that do a very effective job of getting much, much cleaner water into that storage tank that you might look at as well. Uh, but definitely the ceramic filter is something that would give me that water that's safe to drink for, uh, and, and for cooking purposes. Uh, Betsy from Central Illinois writes in, and she says her rain barrels have a lot of slime and sludge from what comes through the screens at the top. Is that water still safe to use on a, be used on a vegetable garden? Uh, it should be, unless there is something that uh, off of the roof that's uh, given off. If it's uh, then maybe an old shingles where there may be something that's given off from that shingles. But uh, I'm much, much more concerned with what falls on that roof uh, than I am what the roofing material is. And so most of that's either going to be dust or debris or bird droppings or things like that that is not going to be a problem for then my garden. I would like for it to all be used as drip irrigation uh, and not sprayed on the leaves uh, of those plants. And that's my bigger concern, uh, putting non-potable water on the leaves. But uh, using drip irrigation, uh, I don't know of any problem that uh, you would encounter. Peter writes, and he wants to know if you have a method of circulation inside those water tanks. So is there something to stir them up and keep the water moving? Yes, uh, even a, a pond uh, bubbler like I would have in a fish tank or then just my, my fish, uh, whatever I call those uh, uh, tanks in my house that have fish in it. I guess that's a fish bowl or a fish tank. Uh, that bubbler, uh, that adds option. It takes very little uh, bubbling water before that whole tank starts turning over uh, and then cycle. I could also use just then a, a pump that I would use on a water feature that would then start sucking and pushing water and turning it over. Uh, that's what I use and I have a large 12-foot uh, diameter pond that I have plants growing in and fish growing in and I just use then my regular waterfall pump then just to keep that water circulated to add then to improve the water quality. So that could be done. A bubbler or something like that could also be done. Or then just uh, recirculate that water if I have a pump so it would spray back in. Uh, but that gets to be more expensive. Uh, something much, much smaller could work uh, and not take as much electricity or effort. Okay, Dave from Arizona has two questions here we can quickly answer. He wants to know, is it practical to capture and store water in the Arizona desert with three months between rainfalls, and his other question was, are there tables for sizing gutters of various rainfall intensities, So, and where could you find that? Okay. Uh, the first one, uh, if it rains wherever you're at, if you don't capture it, it's gone. And so you're dependent totally on then that other water supply, and then much of uh, Arizona and other places are dependent on Colorado's water or then other supplies of water that may or may not going to meet future needs as we move forward. So if I can capture water and it only lasts one week or one month, then that's also then a savings of that other water supply for others or for yourself for future needs. And so, yes, I think every drop that needs to be captured that can, even if it's uh, going to be one inch per year or two inches per year, if you don't, you know that water is going to evaporate instantly and be gone, go back up in the atmosphere and rain on somebody else. And so capturing it then is the only way uh, that you may be able to then save it and then use it later. I forgot what the other question was. 
um, he, he wanted to know, uh, you know, I, I took it off my screen. I'm <laughs> forgetting what he what he'd written on there. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that one, hopefully. Okay. All right. All right. And uh, let's see. Uh, is there a list of companies that with collection tanks? Do you guys have that on your no. website? Okay. So uh, people yeah, your question was, uh, where do I find the information on size and gutters? That's, uh, the one. That's it. Yep. Yeah. The, the Uniform Plumbing Code, IAPMO, IAPMO. Uh, if you go to our A&M website, we have a manual that we put together on designing systems. And so there's 12, 13 chapters in it. Uh, one of those sections is designing gutters, sizing them, as well as sizing downspouts, and all of that. So it's a very in-depth, very uh, technical type of a manual. Uh, but I use that in the two-day trainings that I, I work with and training people to install systems. So there's everything from the from supply demand all the way to disinfection, cold weather, size, and every, all components are all in that manual. So it's rainwater harvesting, uh, system planning, and you can find that on the A&M website. Thanks, Billy. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions here, and, and then we'll have to answer the rest uh, off the air uh, through email. Uh, somebody's going to be giving a presentation on uh, the rainwater harvesting. They're wondering if they can contact you for some slides, I assume, just to, to email you that you could help them out with that um, coming yes. up. Yes. Okay. I'd be glad to help anyone. Uh, anyway, and if it's providing uh, you then some of the slides from this presentation or others that I do, I'd be glad to help you with. Uh, the other question there that I also forgot that uh, uh, was wanting to know where they can find storage tanks. Uh, on that ARSA website are some national then uh, sponsors and then uh, suppliers, uh, but I would go then more local and find that much of the cost in storage tanks is shipping air. So closer you are to then a, a place that builds these collection tanks, the cheaper it's going to be uh, for you. But there are lists of those on that ARCSA website that you can go to uh, to find sources of the collection tanks and the supplies or the materials that are needed from the disinfection or the infiltration there. They are also listed on that website. Okay, we're going to take uh, about two more questions here. I uh, wanted to know if states have required certificates for providers that design and install these systems. So is there a certain certain uh, certification in each state? There is not at this point. Uh, we find that uh, some, lo some states uh, not knowing uh, that the systems need to be installed by a licensed plumber. Uh, so that they are the ones that uh, has to sign off on it. Uh, here in Texas, we feel like that that's going to be the case uh, in the near future, that they're going to require a license or then a certificate for installing tanks. Uh, that's why we're developing this program and making it more in-depth. The test that would go to what we call a master's in rainwater harvesting, a uh, very technical uh, training and test that goes with that. But at this moment, uh, there are some places, I believe uh, the Uniform Plumbing Code says that uh, you either have to be a licensed plumber or someone that is trained in rainwater harvesting. And so we're the only national group uh, that does that. So there are then some places that are moving that direction. As it becomes more popular, as we see more concerns, we're going to seek out those that we feel that are doing it correctly, make sure then that it is going to be safe for the public. Uh, John writes, this is an interesting question, wants to know if there's any uh, systems emerging for the collection of, uh, to dehumidify the, uh, the humid climates to get water out of the air, I guess, to, to water with that. Yes. Yeah, air conditioner condensate is becoming more and more popular all the time. Uh, a bigger concern with that is that Legionnaire's disease uh, is, comes from air conditioner condensate more than it does from rainwater or any other sources there. Uh, so it is one of those things that I have concern. Uh, our physics building at Texas A&M University will capture around 400,000 gallons of rainwater per year, but over a million gallons of air conditioner condensate. And so it's a huge source of, of water, especially in more uh, humid areas, uh, and it is being done all across the United States, taking and utilizing that water uh, rather than letting it go into our wastewater uh, treatment drains. So yes, yes, it is a good source of water. 
I just need to understand then the things that I'm dealing with in it. It's a very aggressive because it doesn't have anything else. It's pure, pure water. Uh, that's going to be seeking other things into then live junk food. So I need to understand that, but it is definitely another source that we need to capitalize on. Okay, Virginia says that uh, she wants to know why do plants, including house plants, grow better on rainwater than house water? Is that true? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I guess there's two or three reasons. One, it doesn't have any chlorine in it. Chlorine is designed to kill things, so it's going to kill the microbes that may be in that soil uh, as well. A healthy soil is going to be full of microbes that's feeding that plant. The other thing is that there's not the minerals that may tie up some of the nutrients that might be in the soil. Uh, it's lower in pH than uh, much of our soil across the United States, although there are some acidic soils, but it's going to be lower in pH that releases in certain nutrients like iron especially. And then it's also then falling from the sky. And every time you get lightning, there's also a little bit of the nitrogen that's going to be added to that water to give it that extra little flush of green to it. So all is good for, for plants to get rainwater. Okay, Billy, I know you've been answering a lot of questions. Here's the last one of the day. Um, and again, the other ones we won't have time to answer. But a, a woman has had a well for over 40 years. She says she's it always had a sulfur smell, but over the past few months, the, the water and the, the smell of the water has gotten worse. Does that mean anything? Is that a, any concern to her? I, I guess I have a concern with that. I think that uh, on a house that I used to have years ago that it would get a sulfur smell whenever the water table was getting low. And then the water would be start coming in, leaching in then from other areas or from that sulfur source. And so it's a bigger concern that uh, is that well going to continue uh, then a long period of time. Uh, is there contaminants that are now in it because I've got too many neighbors that are also drilling wells? Are there too many septic tanks that might be in the region that maybe then, uh, so I guess I would like to test that water to make sure that it's still safe to drink. Uh, we have that problem in many places, and so whether it's going to be sulfur or then some other thing or, of, uh, that may be harmful, uh, if they, she hasn't tested that water, I'd recommend that she test that water to make sure it's still safe to drink. Uh, it may get worse as time goes on, it, as we then may, she may be experiencing drought or then something that has forced more of that sulfur into her water supply. Okay, and, and, and people want to know if the, it's okay to contact you. I can put your email address on the website. Is that all right? To, it is. Have any other questions? Uh, okay, sure. Anyone wherever sure. I am. Uh, I will be doing a training in Honolulu in about three weeks. You can find that information on the, that ARCSA website. Then I will be over in uh, Shreveport, then over into um, East Coast later on in October. Our national conference is going to be in Austin, Texas, the first week in November, and I'll be doing training there as well. There'll be lots of other information we'll be tying in with the uh, Irrigation Association at that national conference. So we welcome all of you there. And if I can help you anytime, either email me uh, or then go to those websites and find some information, and I'll be glad to help. Or you can call me then as we get into need the specific things on problems. And, and that is a great conference. Having gone last year, if anyone out there is interested, I, I would recommend you if you get a chance to attend that. Uh, before we leave today, uh, Nolan Duskin, our, our director, is on uh, with us, and uh, also uh, a couple of folks from our staff. Any questions you might have for Billy before we go? Billy, this is Nolan. I just want to make a comment that we've done, Henry, what, 20 webinars now on amazing topics, yep. clouds, tornadoes, lightning, things of huge fascination, and yet we've had more interest in this rainwater harvesting webinar than any of our others. So all I can say is you're, you're working in an area of great interest, and we appreciate the fact that every drop counts, and you're counting them. So I'm really impressed with that. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's my honor, and uh, if at some future time we want to look at something a little more specific in one direction or another, on rainwater, I'd be glad to help you with that. So with that, I thank you all very, very much for, for staying in. I appreciate the questions, and I'll be glad to respond to you on email on questions that you may have that we didn't get answered. Yeah, thanks, Billy. Really appreciate you taking your time to be with us today. A fascinating subject. 
we've learned a lot, and uh, we, we look forward to collaborating with you more here in the future. Well, folks, that about wraps it up for today's webinar. Uh, please join us next month for our next webinar on uh, August 15th. And that will feature Bill Gray and Phil Klotzbach of Colorado State University. They're going to speak about the Atlantic Basin seasonal hurricane prediction. You've heard probably through the news about Bill Gray's predictions over time. We'll have them here, and they'll talk about the forecast for the 2013 Atlantic hurricane season. And finally, before you leave us today, if you could take that brief survey at the end of the webinar, that would really be helpful to us. So for the staff here at... Uh, Coco Ross in Fort Collins, and for Billy, we want to say have a great day, and thank you for joining us.